Hi everyone, you hear me? Yeah, okay. So, how many of you play video games? Great. How many of you develop video games? How many of you would like to develop video games better? Okay. Again, how many of you know this tool? For those of you that don't know this tool, uh, it is the uh, engine, the framework uh, that has been used for develop the following titles. If you are a video game player, you should recognize at least one of them. Gears of War, one of the masterpieces for the current uh, Xbox. Tekken, this is the seventh installment. Street Fighter, I hope everyone knows it. The recently announced Darksiders 3, this company started with its own engine with the previous two installment, then moved to a real engine 4. This is not so famous, but it is, um, it is a Kickstarter, a successful Kickstarter, made by the designer of the original Castlevania series. And even the remake of Final Fantasy VII, that is one of the most famous and beautiful games ever made, it is in work with Unreal Engine 4. And a lot of more titles. So, before starting working with Unreal Engine 4, you need to get it. Uh, for those of you that do not know it, do not know it Unreal Engine 4 is open source. It's not free software, but it is open source. So you register on the uh, arealengine.com uh, site, uh, and then you get access to the GitHub repository, where you can clone uh, the source code of the whole engine and the editor. You can eventually build it for uh, Linux, uh, Windows, Mac, uh, or download a uh, binary release. How Epic, the company that makes Unreal Engine, makes money. Basically, Epic asks you for, for the 5% when you start earning more than $3,000, only for games. If you make simulations or uh, films or whatever is not consider, uh, can be considered a game, it is free for use. Once you download the engine, you get something like that. On the left side, on the left side you have uh, a list of the actors. An actor is something you can drag on the world the word is a representation of your game. Each actor can have its logic, so you can program them. And when you hit play, your game starts. If those two chairs at table, and I don't know what it is, that strange shadow on the table is, does not impress you, I've prepared uh, another screenshot that I think is way better and can show you how much powerful is Unreal Engine 4. We are programmers, so this is the most interesting question for, uh, for us. How we program a real engine 4? By default, uh, you can uh, program uh, your uh, game logic with C++, that I suppose everyone uh, know, and blueprints. How many of you knows what a blueprint is? OK. No one, basically. Everyone knows C++, right? OK. This is a blueprint. It is basically visual scripting. Uh, on the left, uh, uh, you see an event node. It means when the spacebar event, so when you press the spacebar on your keyboard, do something, in this case is jump. So your character will start jumping. Even if you're not a programmer, it should be easy, understandable, uh, as it cause effect. This is another example of Blueprint. We have another event, left control, on your, uh, on your keyboard. And then we spawn, so we generate a new actor, in this case, a missile. So we basically, we basically shot a missile from the position uh, of our player. The get actor transform on the lower left is to extracting the transform. Transforming the gaming world and the linear algebra world is the description of position, rotation, and scaling of an object in the space. This is another example of a blueprint, the same one as before, but with a delay node added. 
with only that node, we can uh, implement some form of cooldown for your weapon, so you don't start shooting missile one after another, but you uh, slow down them by 0 to 2 seconds. Then you, can, you may want to start working with uh, vector math. It is very common in game development to start working with, uh, with vectors. And then you can easily start with this kind of spaghetti. Or you can do even worse. Now, do not get me wrong. Uh, scripting with uh, Blueprint is effectively programming. Blueprints remove only the syntax part of programming. If you respect uh, all of the good uh, programming rules, uh, it is very hard uh, to make this kind of mess uh, um, by following uh, both common sense and good uh, design rules. Blueprints are effectively uh, really cool. This is a debugging session, so in real time, while your games run, you can see the nodes highlighting, you can stop them, you can make breakpoint, you can see the value of variables to change, and so on. Before starting programming a real engine, you have to know a bunch of concepts. UObject is the main class in the sense of C++ that is used by, um, by the engine. Uh, basically, anything is in the editor, and in your game uh, is a subclass of UObject. An actor is a subclass of your object that can be spawned, so generated on your world, so it is effectively being seen on the world. A pawn is a subclass of an actor. Uh, a pawn is a special actor because it can be possessed. By possessed, it means uh, a controller. A controller can be a keyboard, a mouse, uh, a joypad, everything that can abstract, abstract the, the human player or an AI controller for artificial intelligence. A character is a subclass of pawn that has all of the same characteristics of pawn, but for anthropomorphic figures. So you have a human with a skeleton that can jump, run, uh, crouch, uh, and so on. Then we have component. Components are reusable pieces of code that you, uh, you can attach to all of the previous uh, classes. If you ever already used some other engine, like Unity or uh, Godot, you may be used to the uh, tick paradigm. So you basically write uh, a single function, update tick, uh, uh, it depends on how the editor uh, uh, uses. Um, and in this single function, uh, you make all of your game logic. That, that function is run uh, 60 times per second, 30 times per second, independent of the frame rate of your game. In a real engine 4, using the tick is considered an anti-pattern. You have to rely on events. On the left, you can see a bunch of events, of example events I've defined. So explode, move forward fast, and, uh, and so on. So you should always follow the event paradigm. Why? First of all, for code organization. We have already seen how easy is to uh, generate spaghetti with blueprints. So uh, thinking in an evented way should simplify the organization of your code or visual code. Uh, events are network friendly. Uh, a real engine includes a network stack out of the box. And whenever you use events, that events can be propagated on clients, on the server, broadcasted to, the, to all of the clients, to a bunch of clients, and so on. As you've already seen, you get time management for free. Events can be triggered by animations too. For example, if you are running animation, you can trigger an event when the uh, foot of, uh, of your character is on the ground. I don't know, for spawning particles, or for doing noise. And most important, uh, game development uh, uh, is done by a lot of different figures, uh, from programmers to artists to sound designer, uh, level designer, architect, and, uh, and so on. So there are a lot of non-programmers in, in a team. So uh, following the event pattern should simplify the explanation of your gaming rules to non-programmers. When and why should they choose Blueprint over uh, C++? Unfortunately, not all of the uh, C++ low-level API is exposed to Blueprint, only a little subset. 
Uh, on the other side, uh, writing, in uh, writing shaders, materials in the Unreal Engine uh, Jergo, is extremely easy with uh, Blueprints, is extremely hard with C++ or with the native languages of shaders. Uh, interfacing with C or C++ library is basically a must. Uh, it is very rare that the uh, only included library in the engines will be enough for your, uh, for your work. Uh, blue, uh, good design, the blueprint uh, are really easy to read uh, even for non programmers. This is a personal uh, thing. Blueprints are sometimes too much silent for me during error. Then, this is the central topic. In addition to C and blueprint, we can now uh, program our game logic or eventually script the whole editor with Python. It is, a, it is an open source project. You can freely download it. It's supported on Linux, Mac, and, uh, and Windows. Why I did it? First of all, uh, my dream was to code the AAA uh, level game with Python instead of C++ or eventually Blueprint. Unfortunately, I miserably failed. Why? Uh, when, uh, after the first release uh, of, uh, of the project, uh, I obviously started checking comments on Reddit, Facebook, and uh, all of the channels where I posted the announcement of the, the release. I didn't realize uh, that uh, for the game industry, uh, coding in C++ uh, is not seen as a, as a problem, as something that slows down your, uh, your work. Obviously, there are a lot of more or less uh, uh, myopic programmers that really welcome the, the plugin, but the uh, vast majority of uh, macho programmers uh, throw shit on it uh, without thinking twice. Uh, so instead of stopping working on it, uh, I started asking my colleagues and the other company doing games how uh, I should uh, change the, the direction of the development. So after a bunch of chats with uh, these people, I came up with this list of uh, tasks. First of all, the main project in the AAA industry is managing tons of assets. There are a lot of artists, uh, musicians, that uh, throw assets in the project, and these assets must be managed by programmer. Assets can change, and the programmer have to change again uh, uh, what is mapped to assets, and so on. So scripting, doing orchestration, of uh, your development pipeline, uh, it is something uh, really wanted by the game industry, especially before for artists uh, in the 3D areas, uh, modeling, animating, uh, and so on. Python is already present in their development pipeline. A lot of animators scripts their uh, working pipeline. So having the ability to use the same scripts, the same code base, even into the, eng the game engine, uh, will be really, um, really interesting. Uh, unit testing, uh, as well as functional testing, is not uh, a really diffuse practice in the gaming industry. Uh, most of the time, because uh, writing tests in C or C++ is really hard. If you fail on a test, uh, generally it means a segmentation fault, or a crash, uh, you have to restart your work from, uh, from the beginning. So even having the ability of running uh, unit tests uh, was uh, uh, an interesting thing. There is a lot, you know, there is a lot of uh, Python in the scientific and academic world, and data visualization uh, is another interesting topic for them. So having a really powerful uh, 3D engine will be really useful to show their, uh, their work. Another almost strange thing is uh, simplifying the version, versioning of uh, their work. Uh, a good part of a game is composed by uh, binary data that you cannot version uh, so well. So for uh, uh, a lot of areas, um, it will be very interesting to write code that regenerate uh, the status of, uh, of your project, and eventually write AAA games with uh, the engine. So I started in uh, August uh, last year. Uh, I didn't have high, high expectation. It was more of a, a toy project for me. Uh, first step was obviously embedding uh, a Python virtual machine into the engine, having a console for issuing uh, Python commands, 
and obviously running code and getting output. Uh, if you do not know, I am the uh, author of the UWSGI project, so uh, I have a really huge experience in embedding Python in C and C++ uh, applications. So it was pretty easy for me to reach this level uh, in basically a couple of hours of uh, development. Here you see a, uh, a console uh, built over the native uh, Arial Engine uh, graphical user interface. I've issued the import sys uh, command and I get the, the output. I was uh, really, really, really happy, but then the hard work uh, starts. First challenge. Uh, I already told you that the uh, most important uh, class into the engine is the uobject one. It is the class from uh, where all of the other ones inherit. So I needed to find a mapping between a uobject native C++ class and a Python native class. Uh, following these rules, this mapping must be fast. In this time of the development, I was, really tr uh, I was still trying uh, to uh, use this uh, plugin to write AAA games, so performance was really, really important. This mapping must take into account uh, that uh, both Unreal Engine and both Python have their garbage collection. C++ has obviously no uh, garbage collection, but Unreal Engine implemented one. A funny thing uh, in the a real engine structure is that uh, properties uh, of classes and functions of classes are uh, built uh, like U object. So I needed to find uh, a way to map this uh, particular behavior even to Python. Obviously, even on Python, uh, both classes and properties can be uh, objects. Those are the solutions. For managing uh, the uh, Python U object uh, mapping, I've used a C11 uh, map. If you do not know, C++ only added in 2011 standard the ability to have dictionaries or uh, hashes. When the related Python object goes out of scope, the garbage collector of Python will very probably destroy it. I prevent the garbage collector to destroy the U object mapped to it because uh, uh, a real engine make a different decision by the, the Python uh, virtual machine. So I must ensure that you object are not destroyed without a real engine knowing it because uh, it will mean a, a crash of the whole editor. Whenever from Python I access the uh, PyU object uh, mapping, I need to always check that the, that the map U object is still valid because if it is, uh, if it is still not valid, uh, it means a real engine has kicked out uh, that new object, so the uh, Python uh, mappings maps to something that is no more valid. And then automatically expose properties and function as Python uh, equivalent. After a couple of days, uh, I came up with this. So I can directly call Python script uh, for a real engine native uh, event. Next step. There are, I think, uh, hundreds of C++ classes into the editor. I, I think there are thousands, but let's say hundreds of classes into the um, Arial Engine editor, an engine. Um, mapping each of them to a uh, Python class will be a huge work, a work that I don't want to do. But a real engine exposes a reflection system, so I can uh, uh, basically get a reference to a, uh, a class using a string. My objective was to do something like that. So import the character class like it, uh, it is a native uh, Python class, and spawn on the last line a character, so an instance of a character, into the editor. Don't be scared for the slide. This is how you write extension in C for, uh, for Python. The uh, interesting part is line 150, that find object uh, camel case function. This is how we access the reflection system uh, of uh, a real engine. Basically, with find object, uh, we find a reference to a class with that name. 
and on line 155, uh, we build the mapping within that, uh, that object and its Python equivalent. So now I have a way to, uh, to get a reference to a, an Unreal Engine a native class using a string in Python. What I do with this? I don't know if you can read it. Yeah. Okay. This is basically a hack for uh, uh, faking the import system of Python. Basically, whenever you import, uh, check the last line, from uh, fake importer dot classes, the get at method of faker class is called. So I use uh, this technique uh, to fake uh, the import system. So whenever you import from a real engine dot classes, a special uh, uh, get at method is triggered returning uh, the equivalent classes. Incredibly, incredibly, I get uh, unexpected results, positive unexpected results. The same approach worked even for structure. In a real engine, there are object and there are structures. Structures are passed by, by value, like in the vast majority of languages, and even for enums. So with the same approach, I can import the three main structures of a real engine, and without knowing it, without having an idea that I could already reach that kind of coverage, 80% of the a real engine for reflection system was ready, so with my Python plugin, I was already able to do all of the things we can already do with blueprints. So it was a huge uh, success. Third challenge. Um, scripting the development pipeline includes even generating a blueprint programmatically. I know it's, it could be something strange. It's like generating a language with another language. Um, but this is what uh, people uh, or game developers ask at me, especially animator. In a real engine, animators generally add logic to their animation using uh, blueprints. So for them, uh, it's way more easy to uh, use Python uh, to generate this, uh, that nodes. The results are not really pretty for a, a Pythonista, but this is how, this is how you can build uh, a blueprint graph uh, with Python. What I needed to do to reach that point? I needed to implement uh, Python classes, abstraction classes for graphs. The gray background that you see there. Nodes, the big blocks, and pins, the arrows, uh, and the thing that generates spaghetti every time. The current state of the art can be seen in this uh, tutorial. Basically, with only Python, you can generate uh, a whole monster with its animation, it, it, its brain. Um, I don't remember. <laughs> you can do really a lot of things in this. It is a pretty huge uh, tutorial. As before, I get unexpected results, this time not very positive. I get the ability to script animation graphs for free, that is good. Beaver tree are uh, the blessed way in a real engine to write uh, artificial in, uh, intelligence. They are like uh, state, state machine on steroids. Unfortunately, I've started getting crashes all over the place. What happened? I was obviously working uh, in a way not expected by Epic developers, so I started messing with their, uh, their code. I've started playing at the same level as C++, so we, every error uh, results in a uh, brutal crash of the engine. I was playing uh, as a virtual editor, so basically everything I do from Python should be doable uh, even in the, into the editor. If it is not possible, uh, expect only pain from, uh, from a real engine. And especially the reflection system does not like messing up with their internal structures. After about a year, uh, this system has become uh, really solid. But it required the one year of full uh, time development. Fourth challenge, unit test. 
Here uh, you can see a unit test checking that when I create a new material, a new shader for your uh, graphics card, and I give a name to it, that name is effectively uh, put into the, uh, the engine. It is a, a pretty easy test case. First of all, uh, when we run uh, tests uh, from the command line with PyTest, uh, however you generally do from PyCharm uh, and so on, a new Python interpreter, a new full Python interpreter is generated uh, on your system. So when the tests end, uh, the whole uh, um, data generated by them is erased and destroyed. We cannot generate uh, a whole new Python interpreter into a real engine. It will mean generating a whole new a real engine editor for running uh, a single test. So uh, my solution uh, was generating a Python sub-interpreter. The Python C API allows you to generate a, a new copy of uh, a Python virtual machine uh, that can be destroyed uh, without destroying the main uh, virtual machine. So when you run tests, uh, uh, written in Python, uh, a new uh, Python uh, virtual machine is spawned without destroying the, the original one, and it runs the, the test. Standard output and standard error are mapped to the uh, Real Engine Python console, the window we've seen uh, before. And at each, uh, test, uh, at each run of test, uh, we do rollback. This is uh, one of the features of your Real Engine that shocked me most. It is uh, not documented so well, it is really hidden. I discovered it for, for case, I was checking sources and I found it. Basically, each operation in the real engine editor is a trans uh, transactional one, like in a database system. So I can build my test and roll back, roll back everything they do in the editor. So I, uh, I am free to generate uh, actors uh, into the world, uh, check the, uh, that they are good, and then destroy them. Obviously, uh, the, game the gameplay is still something I really want to do in, uh, in Python. So I've started adding this uh, abstraction. They are uh, uh, subclasses of actor, pawn, character, uh, uh, Python component, and PyHard. We will see later what, what is it. They are a, a wrapper for their uh, native counterpart, but the, with the ability to call Python code at specific uh, events. After a bunch of tests and crashes all over the place, I decided to use a proxy pattern for mapping Python classes to native Unreal Engine object. So basically, you write a native Python class. A special attribute is injected in this class, so you get access to the native Python object. This is an example of an actor fully written in Python. The begin play method is automatically called when the game starts. And the tick method, albeit it is, a, it is an anti-pattern, is called a table refresh of the, of the game. The interesting part here is that self u object, you can see here uh, right out to the location, the self u object attribute that is injected by a real engine when you map a native class to an already existing object. Why I chose this uh, approach? First of all, for almost safe reloading at each play iteration. Once uh, you load uh, a module or a class uh, into the Python virtual machine, uh, uh, that module is resident, that code is resident. But during uh, uh, development, you want to change code. When you do web development, uh, generally you restart the application server to to see um, code modification, we can't restart the whole uh, Unreal Engine editor because it requires a bunch of seconds to, to spawn. So in this way, I can call a simple uh, imp.reload from, uh, from Python to reload the code uh, of a proxy class. In this way, I have, a, uh, I have a clean separation between Unreal Engine 4 and Python, especially from the garbage collection uh, point of view. As the class is not really tied in, uh, I can destroy one of them without uh, bothering too much the, the other one. This is something I found really interesting, uh, but others don't. Uh, once you have packaged your game, you have your executable, 
with all of your Python scripts uh, into the, um, the project directory, you are free to change that Python, uh, that Python files uh, and basically modify all of the game logic. I, logic, I understand this is not a, an interesting uh, thing to do for a game uh, developer or something that it uh, doesn't want to do from its uh, customer. Obviously, you are free to include uh, not the .py uh, files in your build, you can use the compiled one, the bytecode. <clears throat> Another advantage of using a proxy pattern is that, is that I can change during gameplay the class mapped to an object. A character could be mapped at some time of the game to a class and then remapped to another one during uh, gameplay. This is another challenge I'm still working on and I'm still failing at it for those people that don't like the uh, proxy pattern. Basically, I want to allow the developer to subclass uh, native Unreal Engine classes with Python classes. It's something a bit uh, strange and immoral for, <laughs> for some people. <clears throat> As you can see, as uh, um, Unreal Engine uses C++ and it uh, strictly typed, uh, I've used Python 3 annotation for specifying to Unreal Engine what type of value this function take. I'm talking about on CPON. Those are the steps I did uh, for reaching this broken uh, result. Uh, I use the Python annotation for enforcing types. Um, Python became uh, something like a data description language, so I use Python to inform a real engine on how to build its internal classes. I needed to rely on metaprogramming uh, a lot and a lot of pain uh, for reaching uh, the result. Why Python metaprogramming? Because uh, character, the class from each monster inherit, is an object, it is not a class. So I need to write some uh, logic to inherit uh, from an object that is not a class and generate a new class. This is uh, how you can fake the uh, inheritance system. You can see the funny subclass is a child of fake class that is an instance of fake base class. It could blow your mind, uh, I understand. Unfortunately, as I already said, it's still uh, really buggy. It could crash your, uh, your system. Incredibly, as different behaviors on different engine versions, I really I have no idea why it, it, it happens. It is absolutely a good exercise to know how a real engine internals work. I think it is not so worth it because the proxy paradigm is way more safer and solid, but it's obviously a lot, uh, really, really cool, so I think I will try to, to improve it. What I still need to do to improve the project? I would like to uh, stabilize this uh, uh, subclassing API. I would like to introduce mobile integration because currently you can build games already for uh, uh, Linux, uh, Windows, and uh, Mac. I would like uh, a, a stronger integration with PDB for simplified debugging of uh, Python script into the engine. This is uh, a really huge task, uh, cover the whole uh, C++ API. I have still a bunch of uh, doubts. First of all, uh, should I follow in the uh, C part integration of Python? Uh, should I follow the Python C coding style, so underscore uh, lowercase, uh, or the C++11 with full camel case? In the example code uh, you have seen before, the, the implementation of reflection, you have seen uh, two different styles in the code. It is something uh, really, really ugly, but uh, currently I've still not made a, a decision. Should I invest more on threads? Threads are supported out of the box. 
Uh, the gill uh, has become not a huge uh, problem. I added a bunch of tricks to reduce its, uh, its impacts. By default, uh, the binaries you download from the sites uh, have uh, uh, no threads enabled. There are builds with threads uh, enabled. Uh, when I started the, um, the project, a uh, lot of uh, uh, Python developers are really used to Maya or 3D Studio Max. Uh, want to use uh, uh, Qt in their project. So I invested a lot of, uh, in easy integration between, between PyQt and PySide uh, into the engine. Uh, nowadays, uh, I have exposed uh, the native uh, graphical using, uh, user interface of a real engine. So uh, it is called Slate. So it is a, a good solution instead of uh, Qt. Uh, Slate uh, is based on uh, preprocessor uh, C macros, so you can write some kind of uh, readable uh, uh, interface. I've implemented it in Python, uh, trying to give to the developer the same taste of the C++ one. This is how you can uh, generate a window in the um, Unreal Engine with a button on its center. When the button is clicked, the say hello Python function is called. Into the button, there is a text block uh, with a simple string. Currently, I'm dreaming about uh, more orchestration in the game industry. There is still a lot of manual work. I would like to integrate Gherkin for a uh, behavior test. Another dream is uh, uh, build some kind of uh, domain-specific language uh, for writing uh, shaders, so material and or uh, blueprints and obviously someone using it for AAA gameplay. These two companies, Kaiden Lightning is from uh, Los Angeles, and Good Think uh, uh, is from uh, Toronto, Canada. They heavily sponsored the, the development of the project. There are at least dozens, uh, dozens of companies already heavily using uh, it. But these two are the ones that put money into the effort. If you are into the scientific academic world and would like to start drawing your uh, uh, academic research and results uh, into a powerful uh, graphical engine, this is a really gentle introduction uh, for Pythonista that includes matplotlib into your game. So basically, whenever the uh, player walks over one of that uh, colored cube, the uh, graphs on the carpet uh, it is updated with generating, and generating a, new, a new pie charts. I need to switch laptop because unfortunately a real engine is able to melt down my <laughs> MacBook Pro. So give me a minute. Okay, can you see it? So, this is the third person template you can uh, generate from the uh, standard uh, Unreal Engine distribution. I have added on the level uh, a bunch of uh, phases, of famous phases, so when I play the game, I can move into the world. Let's see Spock, uh, Gillian Anderson, Wolverine. <laughs> at 800, Sheldon, and so on. My object objective now is to um, 
allow the player, the mannequin, to see and recognize faces uh, using facial recognition included in OpenCV, Open Computer Vision, all in Python. First step is adding uh, a Python actor into the scene that will uh, implement the uh, height, the sight of our uh, player. So in the list of actors, I search for Py actor and I drag into the scene. On the right, you can see the fields where you can specify the module and the class to map to this actor. We will start with this simple code. Into the uh, init method, uh, we better. You initialize uh, a timer of one second. And begin play, you simply print some message into the console. And then this uh, value of, of timer is decreased at every tick. And when it reaches the, uh, zero, it means the time has elapsed and restart counting. It is a, a very simple code just to check uh, the Python actor is, uh, is working. So the model is eyes first. Oops. And the class is sight. This is our Python console. I hit play, and on the bottom, you should see on red the elapsing time. So our Python actor is already working. Let's go on. Second step is adding us, um, a special component to our actor. It is the scene capture component 2D. Basically, you can see it as a virtual camera that uh, track anything uh, it sees and save it into a texture. A texture is a, a memory area into the, um, your graphics card that can be drawn on the screen. During the initialization, we generate a, a special texture known as a render target. It is where our uh, capture component will write data. I've called it what I'm seeing. I create a texture 512 for 512. You should always try to use the power of true texture when doing game development. It is a transient object. It means uh, uh, it is not an asset on your pipeline. When the uh, game ends, this object is destroyed. This special look is called automatically, if defined, before initializing components in your actor. So we want to add uh, uh, a new component, so we use this hook to create it. This is how we add a component in our code, the send capture one. We specify in which texture he has to write uh, uh, data, and we specify that we want uh, the uh, linear values of the colors. It is uh, something I will not want to invest time in explaining you. It is not the topic uh, interesting for, uh, for us. So I go there and change the model to eyes second. I hit play, and here you can see PyActor with a new component, scene capture, on the right. It is already tracking what is seeing. Unfortunately, we cannot see what the player is seeing. Before doing this, we have to fix another problem. This uh, PyActor as no position into the world. Our objective is to attach it over the head of the player. Here all is the same. Once the game starts, we get a reference to the pawn used by the player, in our case, the mannequin. The the robot uh, working on the, on the screen. And then we attack ourselves, the object. This is the injected uh, uh, field into the proxy class. And we attach it to the mesh component of the mannequin into its head bone. What is a bone? Here you can see 
our player, and on the left you see the bones mapped to its mesh. Uh, bones uh, are basically um, objects mapped to a group of vertices. So whenever I move uh, a bones, vertices follow it. So our objective is to attach our eyes to the head of the player. So, eyes third. So if we go back, you see the third person character, that is our uh, mannequin, as Pi Actor 7 as its child. Okay, here you can see the axis of the character, and here you can see the axis of our Python actor. As you can see, it is moving, because the head of the mannequin while in idle to some kind of breath. Okay, next step. We want to develop a hub a head-up display, some kind of 2D graphics onto the screen, so we can see what the player is seeing. We have added this code, so we spawn a new actor into the scene, a head is another actor, directly specifying the Python module and the Python class to use. We get a reference to the proxy class mapped to this hub, so we, we can start injecting values into it. And we specify into the proxy class which is the texture to draw. And finally, we tell the engine that this new Python hub should be the uh, player one, so the uh, default uh, created one is destroyed, so our Python one will be used. This is our hub. Uh, uh, HUD proxy class expects you to define a draw HUD method where you can call uh, graphics primitives like drawing textures, uh, lines, uh, rectangles, and so on. Until uh, texture to draw, I remember you, it is defined uh, in the other class. It is not defined, uh, it takes it from the method. If it is defined, it will start drawing it uh, at the zero, zero position, so top left uh, with these sides. So, <clears throat> said before. Okay, on the top left, you can see what the player is seeing. You can see even the balancing when it runs or when it breath. So basically we have a texture containing all of the pixel the player is seeing. Next step, for uh, good results, uh, OpenCV needs a grayscale uh, image. So we need to generate a grayscale uh, variant of this texture. It is pretty easy. This is the fifth one. This time we import the CV2. It is the wrapper for OpenCV and NumPy because OpenCV uses NumPy for, it, uh, for all of the data. In the tick method of our eyes, we get the data as a byte array of the texture, of the data we are seeing. We inform, we generate a new NumPy array giving uh, special dimensions. So we have a, a, a three-dimensional array with uh, four components, R, G, B, A, and uh, uh, the sides of the texture. And we use this OpenCV function to convert this texture from BGRA to grayscale. So basically we have a byte for a single pixel of the image. On the other side, the HUD class is changed. It is now in the HUD second module.
we create uh, another texture with a single uh, channel for, uh, for color, another transient, te uh, transient texture. This time, uh, we need to cooperate with a real engine uh, garbage collector because this texture is never used by real engine. It, it even does not know it exists. So after a bunch of time, it will destroy it. We do not want this, so we inform with this method that we are responsible for destroying it when the Python object is destroyed. And in addition to drawing what the player is seeing in full color, we draw another texture below it without ignoring transparency channel because we have a single byte for each color. So I needed to add these additional values. So. So we have the same view, but in grayscale. Now, OpenCV is able to recognize faces from the below image. This is the last version of the code. This is, uh, these remain the same. All of the OpenCV logic has been done in the HUD. So we set up a cascade classifier. It is the way OpenCV uses, it is the algorithm OpenCV uses to uh, detect uh, something. In this case, uh, I have fed it with uh, information about frontal phases. And then at each iteration, I try to detect phases with this function, detect multiscale, and it will return a uh, uh, quadridimensional uh, array with the information about where the face is. Okay, you should see green. See it? Okay, whenever it detects a faces. Let's see if we can recognize Spock. Here it is. It is even recognizing uh, Dana. I push Spock away. People with beard uh, are really hard to recognize, but this time is uh, <laughs> taking it good. We have a, okay. I don't know if it is a good thing, but it is not able to recognize a terminator. I don't know if it's good or bad. It is interesting that it is not able to recognize Sarah Connor. I think it's because of the goggles, of the battle goggles that are really strange for, uh, to recognize for a machine. Last part. Uh, by default, uh, Arial Engine uh, has no features for uh, using the webcam uh, of your mobile phone or your, uh, of your laptop, but OpenCV is able to do it. So I've created this uh, cube and I've added it a Python component uh, mapped with the utils webcam class that initialize a video capture create a transient texture with the size of the uh, texture my webcam is able to, uh, to manage. And I assign that texture to the material, to the shader assigned to the, to the cube. At, at every frame, I try to capture the image from the webcam. I convert it to a suitable format for my graphics card, and I assign that data to my texture. Okay, I think you should see me. Oh. Okay, it is see me. Thank you.
work. Uh, who has a question for Roberto? Ah, great. Uh, I had been working for Crytek for five years, and I know what game development is, uh, and I know what pain it is to code game logic in C++ or in Lua script, uh, and uh, how ugly look uh, unit tests. Come on, Lua script is not so painful as C++. <laughs> yes, yes, but anyway. So I think integrating uh, game, game logic uh, and coding it in Python is a really great idea and uh, it's absolutely brilliant. So it's bravo. I, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And uh, I wanted to ask you, did you have any performance issues, uh, especially in tick methods, uh, calling it uh, in update loop in every Performa frame? Performance issues? Yes, yes. Um, I've started having performance issues when I started uh, uh, doing it too much with the GIL. Acquiring and releasing the GIL is one of the most heavy um, uh, parts uh, into the Python virtual machine. So the default build you, you get from the site have the GIL completely disabled, so you cannot use uh, Python threads. And the impact of Python is not uh, so bad. Uh, last year, uh, Blueprints uh, uh, was uh, uh, an interpreted language, and Python was faster than Blueprints. Now Blueprints are compiled to native C++ code, so unfortunately they are faster than, uh, than Python. Thank you. Another question? Ah, yeah. hey, come on. <laughs> Just a quick question. Um, how do, do people interact with uh, Python inside Unreal? Is there only the REPL, or is there also an ability to maybe extend the, the ribbon bar there on top? Like putting little scripts into recurring sorry, actions? Sorry, I, I cannot hear you. Oh, sorry, I try again. Uh, I was wondering how people would interact um, with, with Python inside Unreal. Is there, um, uh, so I saw the REPL, obviously. And uh, is, this, is there also um, a thing planned to put like code snippets into buttons on the top of the ribbon for users that are maybe not so much also deep into coding? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> no, ju just yes, wondering. The, the hero is, can I? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, I, um, so I saw the REPL, so people would interac interact with Unreal in Python via the REPL, and maybe there's some recurring tasks people have um, while working with Unreal. I was wondering if there was also planned maybe to have some of these buttons that I see on the top to, to in incorporate Python snippets in there. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, I, I imagine. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Mm, another question now? I don't need to run. Okay. That's fine. Thank you, Roberto.